Hey, what's up everybody? Let's talk birds in flight. How do we photograph them? All right, so the best advice I can give you in the first place is ignore what everybody else is telling you. Go practice, 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 practice. That's the best thing you can do. There's no way any online tutorial, any book, anything you read or watch can teach you the most difficult, one of the most difficult things about birds in flight, and that is finding and tracking your subject through a long telephoto lens. If you don't have much experience doing that, that is gonna be one of the most challenging things you're gonna find about doing birds in flight photography. Just being able to know, instinctually know where you have to point your lens to find that bird when it's flying through the sky is incredibly hard, especially if it's not in focus to start out with. And then just being able to track it especially if it's more erratic moving, that's another challenge as well. But that initial acquisition and finding the subject is the hardest thing. And the only way to get better at that is practice. Go out and practice and shoot a ton, okay? So that being said, let me tell you a whole bunch of things about bird and flight photography. Hopefully these things can help though. Uh, obviously there are some settings and focus settings, camera settings and things like that, and just some techniques that can generally help. But the easiest way I think to practice is just sit in your backyard and Get your longest lens on. If you have a zoom lens, zoom it out to the max, right? You want to practice this with the longest focal length possible and just start picking different objects. So let's say you sit in your yard, pick seven different objects or a handful of different objects, right? I don't know why I came up with seven. That's a really weird number. I always like to pick weird numbers. Anyway, besides the point, pick a handful of objects at different distances at di in different lighting and then just put your camera down, pick it up and try and point at it and find it. Put it down pick it up and try and point it at something different. That is the practice you need to be able to just say, oh, hey, there's a bird flying. Let me point my lens right at it and, and find it and be able to track it. Like right now, there's some grackles right there. Got them. Just like that, okay? And those birds were just flying through the sky like that. That is the practice that will help you the most with your bird and flight photography. So let's talk about the setup, okay? Um, a lot of the times, I'll actually come out and shoot this uh, 400 millimeter 2.8 lens handheld. It's pretty lightweight. It's actually not that bad. So if I just kind of ditch it off of the monopod here, I mean, you can see, you know, I can kind of just hand hold it here now. Uh, this is the most freedom of movement. If you have a lightweight setup and you're comfortable hand holding it, hand hold it. It's gonna be the best. It's gonna be the easiest, most lightweight setup. It's gonna allow you to just point in any direction, the easiest way, change up, down, perspective, all of that stuff. But if it's a heavy lens like this, it gets tiring. Like last night I was out here shooting and my arm just gets tired and I end up putting the thing down, you know? And then it's like, oh, pick it back up again and down. It gets exhausting. So the next level, and this is what I usually will shoot, is a monopod. So let me just clip into the monopod here really quickly and show you why I like the monopod kind of over the tripod. So over handheld, there we go. I'm holding the lens basically up to my eye here. Look at that. I don't have to support any weight, nothing like that. So I'm using a Wimberly, uh, what do they call this? MH100 monopod head, really compact. And here's the beauty of it. Once you balance it, you can just point your lens in any direction, okay? So that's the cool thing. It basically makes it weightless here and it doesn't need to rotate left, right because it's just a single stick. So this, the monopod just rotates on the ground. That's what gives you that left, right rotation. So nice things about a monopod, right? Um, freedom of movement, it supports the weight for me, and I can just easily track anywhere I want, and I can point up here. I mean, generally I shouldn't be shooting up here, but every once in a while there's something creative, right? Uh, I can also change my height really quick. So see right now I'm shooting about eye level. Well, what if I wanna go lower? I drop it back and just tip down, just like that, okay? So that just gives me a lot more freedom. I can move left and right. And here's the other freedom it gives me that a tripod does not easily. And that is all of a sudden I wanna shoot something over here. I just pick it up, set it down and shoot. Now, if there's something behind me, pick it up, set it down and shoot. Look at the freedom of movement I have without even picking it up actually, watch. I can go from here and then just take a step, shoot over here, take a step, shoot over here. It's just the central pivot point I have to work around, okay? So that's why I really love a monopod for shooting this kind of stuff. All right, monopod, be gone. The next thing that you'll see many and most photographers shooting is on a tripod. So let me get mounted in here. 
So you have your gimbal head. Uh, let me try and balance it. Just like the, the, it's basically a gimbal head, what I had on that monopod, except a lot bigger, right? But I balance it. I can kind of point the lens anywhere I want. It's weightless. So this is really convenient. I will give you that, right? And the other nice thing about this, unlike a monopod is, I can let it go, okay? So I don't have to constantly hold it. If I'm gonna be standing here shooting these birds flying around out here, like I was this morning and last night, it's pretty convenient. But here's some limitations. I cannot change my height. There's no, no e I can't change it easily. It's gonna take me a while to lower this and then get it level again in order to change my height. I can pick the whole thing up and point it at the sky, but that's not easy. I'm generally not gonna do it. So I'm limited. I mean, I can point it up a good bit, but I'm just a little bit more limited versus picking the thing up. Again, not that you should be shooting that high that often, but you know, sometimes something happens and it's kind of a cool shot. Um, the other limitation I find is if I wanna spin from over here to over there, I have to walk around this to then point over there, okay? So the legs can actually get in the way. Now, most of the time when we're photographing birds in flight, that's not really a big deal. We're not pointing all over the place. In general, right now, I'd be shooting out this way, and if anything, I would leave it just like this. I can shoot all the way out to the left side of the island. I can swing all the way out to the right side of the island. Absolutely no problem. I can basically cover most of my basis for shooting. And if something did happen somewhere else, I could always spin around and, you know, I can actually walk around and make that happen. So it's not too big a deal. I'm just going to pause for a second and let this boat go by. Uh, they're going to go slow. So the nice thing about a tripod, though, is it is the most stable platform. I'll give you that. But with birds in flight, you're generally shooting higher shutter speeds. And so you don't really need the most stable platform. Uh, you're freezing a bird flying in the air. So a little camera shake from you or the monopod isn't going to make that big of a difference. All right, so now let's actually take a look through the lens and see what settings we can use to help get sharp bird photos. Real quick though, the one thing I recommend starting with is something like this. So I'm at a wading bird rookery here. So I have spoonbills, great egrets. I think there's some snow egrets, but those are the main species here. Some other wading birds do come in. Wading birds are big, slow, predictable. They don't fly too erratically. Those are easy subjects to start with. Same as like, um, bigger raptors like bald eagles. I know that's a big popular one people like to photograph in flight. Stuff like that is really easy. They're, they're all big and slow moving and so much less challenging than say, um, you know, some mid-size, some of the smaller wading birds are really fast like um, the cattle egrets, tricolored herons, little blue herons. They're a little bit more fast and erratic. Um, and then obviously if you get into songbirds or, you know, kingfisher or, and things like that, way faster, way more erratic flying, just more challenging, swallows, like forget it, you know. Those species are all gonna be really difficult to learn with. So big, slow moving, um, non-erratic flying birds are good to start with. So let's take a look. I'm sorry, everyone. Let's take a look at this beautiful photo of a spoonbill in flight and let me add in the one thing I forgot to mention, which is what focus mode do you use as far as single shot? or continuous or what they call servo in Canon land and it's always going to be the continuous mode so for Nikon and Sony you're always for birds in flight going to want to be using autofocus continuous or AFC and for Canon you want to use uh, the AF servo mode not the single or single shot mode single shot will lock on to a subject and not continue to track continuous or servo will always continue to track as long as you're half pressing your shutter button or pressing your AF on back button autofocus. So that is one very important thing I kind of forgot to mention. Basically, I never take my camera out of continuous or servo focus mode. It works for all bird photography, even when they're static, just portraits. I still use that mode. It works the best. So I just wanted to add that in. Back to the video. All right, so we're gonna start with mirrorless settings here because that's what I'm shooting right here. All right, ignore the light. The light is atrocious. All right, so do you shoot manual or auto ISO? Like manual ISO or auto ISO? There's a little bit of back and forth there. Um, this morning when I was shooting, I was mixing it up. Last night when I was shooting, I was mixing it up. In light like this, when it's really consistent, I would say, let's just go fully manual. So let's do that, right? We're gonna go manual shutter speed here. And I'm gonna zoom in on the white bird because I don't wanna overexpose them. So look at that. I need to go higher with my shutter speed 
and lower with my ISO. Again, this light is really atrocious right now, so these settings are gonna be pretty high, but look at that. Now I have detail in the left side of that bird, the light side of that bird, and so that's basically what I want, 64 hundredth of a second at 100 ISO. Let's talk about minimum shutter speeds, though. If you are in lower light, which is gonna be better light, where do you start? With birds like this, I'm happy going at 800th of a second. That is a decent shutter speed. As long as they're not flying too erratically and I'm on a stable path with them, I can totally get sharp photos. That's not ideal, but I'm happy to start there if my ISO is too high, right? So it's always that shutter speed ISO balance that we're trying to manage. And so, yeah, if it's like my ISO is at 5,000 ISO, and I'm at 16 hundredth of a second, I'm gonna cut them both in half and go down to 8 hundredth of a second, and that'll put me in at around 2500 ISO at that point. And that's much more manageable for the ISO, and it'll give me um, a manageable shutter speed. Now, where am I happiest? For birds like this, 12 50th of a second, 16 hundredth of a second's plenty. Once I hit 2000, I'm good. 2000th of a second and higher is more than enough. But do not ignore those shutter speeds lower than that. In between a thousandth of a second and two thousandth of a second, there's tons of opportunity to get great sharp photos. And I did plenty of that this morning when it was lower light. So that is one of the misconceptions I think a lot of photographers don't understand is you can get away with lower shutter speeds. That being said, if you're trying those lower shutter speeds and not getting good results, obviously increase that, right? Don't just blindly listen to me, but I do suggest you experiment with lower shutter speeds than you think and you'll probably get away with it. Thank you for being so loud, Lemkin. <laughs> They're so obnoxious. All right, so now that we have our shutter speed set, um, aperture, that's the one other thing, right? I personally just shoot wide open all the time. It gives me the most light, the lowest ISO, so the fastest shutter speed, and the most blurred background. Uh, increasing your aperture, okay? If we're talking 400 millimeter plus, if I am set at 2.8 right now on 400 millimeter, if I increase that to, let's say, f8, we're talking about maybe getting this much in focus at 2.8, and then maybe this much in focus at f8, okay? It is not that big of a difference. And on a bird this size, it's not gonna make that big of a difference. What I need is that bird to fly parallel to me in order to get the entire bird in focus, or most of it in focus. And that's usually what I'm looking for anyway, other than the occasional flying right at me shot, okay? So increasing that aperture to get more of the bird in focus or give yourself more room for air, I personally, over the years of experience, haven't found that to really be true. I'd rather have that faster shutter speed and lower ISO. So I just shoot wide open all the time and it just gives me those settings better. So there we go. So it's basically when I'm manual like this, I'm just going to be you know, picking that shutter speed and then uh, picking the ISO and letting it be there. If you're using auto ISO, then just let the auto ISO range around in there, totally fine, okay? Now, let's actually track something in flight here, okay? So here we go, I'm using 3D tracking with the animal recognition in the Z9. And you can see it's just tracking this bird now, this is easy. This is way, a good way to practice, by the way, against blue sky, really easy, okay? So it just tracked it. Now look at this little tiny bird. See that? It's barely, there we go, it got it. And now it lost it, okay? Here we have something else coming in. Looks like a grackle, or no, an inga. So again, up against this blue sky, really easy. So this is where you wanna start practicing and track that. All right, for DSLR users, you're gonna be doing something different and I'll, I'll do a whole section on that in just a little bit. But for me, with any of these mirrorless cameras, the way to go is with the automatic tracking, this, this 3D tracking on the Z9 or uh, animal bird eye detection, any of those types of things. See, look at this tracking, even way out there, it's doing decent staying with that bird, okay? Let's see if we can find something else. Here's a spoonbill coming across. See, we got him, he's tracking. And the best part about this is, look, I can compose. I can put him left of the frame, right of the frame, top of the frame, kind of anywhere I want. Here we have another egret coming in. Look, so we can get him and then look, put him in the right of the frame, oops, and keep more space in front of him. So I get to compose as the bird is flying. That is the beauty of these automatic tracking methods. And look at that, it kept it through all that busy background and everything, okay? It did a great job there. Here comes another one, now he's a little late but you can see how well that works. If you're struggling with that, I would then suggest, here, let's try again. There, we got him picked up. More space in front of him, and then he lands. Then we have the other one taking off. So look, I can put him top left of the frame, 
and then he's gone. <laughs> All right, so other modes we have. Uh, you can narrow it down by putting a, a sort of large box around it. A lot of these mirrorless cameras have that. Um, in this case, it's called AF Area Large on Nikon. And Nikon has the advantage, I don't know if it's an advantage over the others, but it does still track the subject within that if it finds it. So let me see if I can wait for a bird in flight here and try and make that happen. So there we go, we found it. And look at that, see it picked up the subject within it. Now here's the limitation though, is I can't compose this bird any way I want. As soon as I go out of the frame, look, it's not tracking anything anymore. I have to get him back in there in order for it to track it, okay? So see that? It stays within the box there, it's tracking that bird within the red box, but as soon as I leave too far, obviously it's focusing on the trees, but it's not gonna track my subject. Oh, I just missed that spoonbill flying at me. That would've been a good test. So this works pretty good, but it limits your composability out of it, okay? It does, however, narrow down the area. And then you have AF area small, same thing. This works really good for like tiny birds. Look at this little guy. There we go, I'm tracking him, I got him. So for stuff like that, that can work. But look, even this, see that? All of a sudden it's tracking the bird within there. But we have a small box to work with. We're basically just trying to narrow down where it's going. And you can see I still lost it and caught the background. Here's an easy vulture coming in. There you go, it's tracking that bird within that little box, okay? So I don't find this one very useful. If I'm going to use a box, I'm gonna use a larger one like this. It gives me a little bit more play to keep the subject in the frame. But honestly, if I just do the entire 3D tracking like this, then I can just stay with that bird, compose it anywhere I want in the frame. Every time, it, every so often it will mess though. But there, once it has it and I stay with it, I can just compose that bird anywhere in the frame. Watch, here we go. Here's another one flying over there. It did lose it though, so I let go and refocus again. That's another tip, right? If you lose focus, notice that it catches the background or something you didn't want. Let go of your focusing button, whether that's your back button or your shutter button, and then try and acquire it again. Let's wait and see if we have another bird coming in here. Here we go. Got him. Let's say I lose it, let go, try again. Okay? That's how that works. So that's pretty much it, guys. It's, there's not too much more to it other than the practice at this point. Okay? So let's talk about DSLR settings next. All right, for you DSLR folks, things are a little bit different. Camera settings wise, as far as shutter speed, aperture, ISO, exactly the same as what I just mentioned in the mirrorless section, but the focusing is certainly gonna be different. So I'm gonna use my mirrorless camera because that's the only way I can record through the viewfinder, but I'm basically gonna show you what standard DSLR camera focus settings are, okay? So let's take a look through the viewfinder here. We'll just pick any old subject. Let's go with this. There we go, we'll find that great eager over there. Okay, so for DSLRs, the first option is single point autofocus, okay? Just one little point, and then I have to try and keep that on my subject. So let's watch how this works. I got it, and I'm tracking it, but see how it's constantly kind of, not constantly, but definitely jumping in out. Look how hard it is for me to keep that one little point on that bird. Now it's a big, slow moving bird, so I managed a little bit. This is not easy. <laughs> Generally, do not use single point autofocus to try and track birds in flight. You will drive yourself insane, okay? Every so often though, I do miss focus and then I'll switch to single point real quick. Like, so if you can set a button to just switch to single point, it can sometimes get you back on the bird of the general area. Then you can let your other focusing methods take over. So here's the most common method I would use on a Nikon DSLR, and that's called dynamic autofocus. So basically what it's using is either a small box with some surrounding points or uh, a point with more surrounding points. Uh, on the mirrorless it does get a larger box but on DSLRs it would not. It would just be that standard center focus point and then you get the surrounding points assisting you. So let's see how that works. It should work really good here. I just need something flying. There we go. We got him, it's staying with me. Let's try this egret over here. Now uh, he's against the trees, but look at that. See how it's picking up the trees a lot more? I mean, that's tough because it was a really uh, challenging angle. Here we go, slow flying vulture against blue sky. Always easier. But see how it's staying in focus as he's flying towards me? And look, every so often I miss, 
but it's staying with him because those surrounding points are grabbing focus for me, okay? There we go, let's grab this guy, same thing. There we go. So, this works great. Here's the one limitation with this. You can't compose the shot. Unless you can figure out how to move those group of focus points around while you're tracking, which is not an easy thing to do. If you can do that, then great. You know, if you know your birds are always flying from right to left, let's see, these guys, now they're flying away. If they're always flying from right to left, like coming in this way, well then by all means, move your group of focus points over here, and then you can track them in that way, and look, always have more space off to the left, which would be the direction the bird is looking. So let's look at this goofball down here, okay? So let's say they're always flying from left to right. I would move my group of focus points over here and try and track it that way. But uh, if they turn direction or change erratically, here, watch, let's try these guys coming in. See that? Look, I have more space in the direction they're looking, okay? So that works, but it is not easy and it doesn't allow you to be flexible. So in general, I'm going to stay with my focus box in the middle. It gives me the most freedom of air and the most ability to compose after the fact in, in uh, cropping and post, okay? So the other option is basically what's gonna look like this. On Nikon DSLRs, it's called group focus. It's basically just like a cluster of focus points, okay? On the mirrorless, they show it as uh, a box like this or a box like that. Um, on the DSLR, you're just gonna see five focus points kind of lit up. And just like we talked about with the mirrorless, uh, you're basically just keeping that group of focus points on the subject and it should work quite nicely like that. So that's it folks, those are all your settings. The biggest thing that's gonna help you the most, however, is practice, practice, practice. Uh, obviously keeping those shutter speeds up high enough to get sharp photos is good. Also, the lens makes a difference, okay? Um, a lot of you are probably shooting some of these super zoom lenses, these 150 to 600s or 200 to 500 focal lengths, especially if they're like Sigma or Tamron. Um, I generally, unfortunately, don't find them great for birds in flight. It is not to say you can't get birds in flight, but you're gonna need bright light. You're gonna need strong light and they're slower focusing. So you're just gonna miss a little bit more, okay? So sometimes you could have good technique, good skill, but you're still just not gonna be able to keep up with that bird because of the limitation of that lens. It's not so much the camera, Most, almost any modern camera has enough ability with its autofocus tracking to keep up with a subject, mirrorless or DSLR. But some of these lenses will give you limitations. This is a 2.8 lens, it's incredibly fast. So it just snaps in and out. I mean, watch as we go through here. Look at, grab that one, grab that one, grab that one back there. I can go, watch, I'll focus on something close here and let's wait and look how fast. So focus close here and then tap. Like that's how fast it jumps in to autofocus somewhere else. So let's try again. I'm focused pretty close here. I'll grab, go for that bird way out there. There we go, just like that, grab them, okay? So it's really fast and snappy and will certainly give you more opportunity to get sharp photos. It's gonna get the bird in focus initially faster, which can help you track it. And all of those things are just gonna be a benefit. So just be aware that sometimes you may be running up against the limitation of your gear, but it's not to say you can't get good photos. It may just mean you have to shoot in a little bit brighter light, which is fine because it's action. We're not looking for the best portrait light. Obviously it looks nicer with better light, but it doesn't have to be. If it's cool action, cool position, good bird in flight, you can still get it when the sun's a little bit brighter. I would not be shooting in this bright of light right now. It's really, really harsh, but um, you know, an hour after sunrise, the light's strong, but it still is low, has some direction to it. That kind of thing can certainly work for you. So those are my tips and suggestions for birds in flight. Um, I know it's not a lot of, you know, do this and it's going to work. It, it really is just more about the practice, but hopefully some of these settings and suggestions can help you out and go out and have fun guys.